Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here speaking with all of you today about probably one of my favorite features in Airflow 3, being able to run tasks anywhere and in any language. I am Vikram Koka, the Chief Strategy Officer at Astronomer and based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. So for those of you who are local, please do give me a shout. We'd love to kind of catch up after at any time. I've been working on Airflow since 2019 as part of the Astronomer team. My, uh, I've primarily been leading the engineering team, working on open source, working on Apache Airflow. My personal contributions to Apache Airflow really also started in 2019, primarily on the architecture and design side, initially with Scheduler HA, which we released as part of 2.0. Since then, I've actually been working on, uh, along with the rest of the team, on features such as data sets, data-driven scheduling, dynamic tasks, setup and teardown, and now Airflow 3. I'm honored to have with me a man who needs no introduction, Ash Berlin-Taylor. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ash. I've uh, been involved in Airflow, as you may have heard from the thing, since about 2017. Uh, committer since 2018. Yeah, I think biggest achievement to date, kind of rewriting the schedule there for 2.9 for Treasure HA. Ah, I'm sorry, jet lag. I'm going to blame my jet lag. <laughs> so one key question as we kind of get started, right? Why? How did we start on this journey itself? And the key question really started around the change in use of Airflow. As all of you here today, and I think in the panel, in the panel discussion earlier today, there was quite a bit of conversation about how Airflow has grown. Airflow has started off with a tremendous viral adoption over the last four plus years, over the last 10 years, with citizen data engineers downloading Airflow, writing DAGs in Python, deploying these DAGs as part of their regular day-to-day -day work. And that process has actually been tremendously successful, and we've seen growth by probably 50x over the last four years based on sheer Python downloads alone. These DAGs, written by these data engineers, have slowly become mission critical in organizations. As organizations have been adopting Airflow and have realized that these DAGs have now become mission critical, larger adoption of Airflow has happened with larger teams starting to deploy Airflow and work with these data pipelines in larger organizations. And as the number of people using Airflow and the number of people writing data pipelines has grown, it's natural that we've run into a few operational problems when Airflow, when Airflow is deployed at scale. What are some of these problems? The first one of these is task isolation, which was brought up even as part of the Airflow survey. For those of you who may not be aware of the Airflow survey, this is a survey which we as a community run every year. Please do take the time to fill it out in the, in the upcoming year. We actually take the feedback from the survey very seriously. We spend a lot of time pondering about the feedback from the survey. And task isolation was no different. Once we saw the feedback on task isolation, and this is a topic which has come up in many different forums and discussions, we started discussing what exactly does this mean? What exactly do we need to actually identify? And there's a lot of conversations which happened about it, which led to a couple of other key issues which are raised by a bunch of customers, by a bunch of people using Airflow, bunch, by several people administering Airflow. And these were really about dependency management and Airflow version upgrades at scale. Together, these were things which we spent a lot of time thinking about. And what does dependency management mean? What does task isolation mean? What does Airflow upgrades mean, right? Task isolation is the ability to run the task and have no interference whatsoever with any other task running in Airflow, including security, including reliability, including the notion of like, you know, hey, this can run independent. There is going to be no ripple effects whatsoever. Depends, dependency management is something which really happens when you have multiple data teams using an Airflow deployment together. Typically what happens, because it's a Python-defined framework, people start using additional Python frameworks in their, in their tasks, and as multiple different data teams start using different frameworks, these start to have conflicting dependencies over a period of time, which then makes dependency management a pain to deal with. Finally, and like, you know, related to this, as you start having dependency management problems over time, one of the dependent sources for these dependencies conflicts could well be Airflow itself, wherein a new Airflow version 
comes up with a different set of Python dependencies, potentially as part of providers, and this has de dependency conflicts. When you choose to upgrade a new Airflow version, conflicting with dependencies with people's pre-existing DAGs and tasks which are actually running, and this causes problems in version upgrades for Airflow going forward. Ton of discussion about this in the community, ton of offline conversations, and like we've tossed around different approaches to solve this particular problem, probably well over the last year. And we finally decided that we needed to make a core architectural change within Airflow to solve this particular problem, and that's the detail for this particular talk. Almost certainly, for anybody who's actually used Airflow, you understand how the Airflow architecture works, but here's a quick high-level overview. The DAG file processor reads the DAGs, converts them into a DAG, into a serialized form, which is actually stored in the Airflow metadatabase. This is basically since Airflow 2.0. These serialized DAGs are then viewed at and looked at by the scheduler, which takes these DAGs and when the time is right, starts scheduling individual tasks from those particular tasks when the dependencies are met sends each of those tasks over to an Airflow worker, which is available from the pool of available workers. These workers look at the context for that particular task, start executing them, and then finally reporting the status back from the completed task over to the metadatabase again. The Airflow web server looks at the data from this particular metadatabase, shows it so you can look at the overall context of like, you know, everything which is going on, which DAG run, when is it queued, when is that, what is the status of this as part of the Airflow UI. So one consistent theme you see is that everything surrounds the Airflow metadatabase, looks at the Airflow metadatabase, including the Python task therein. In a large organization, this can cause issues because the Python code running in these particular tasks has direct access to the Airflow metadatabase. In an inadvertently, somebody could write some SQL which can basically go over write elements in this Airflow metadatabase, read information from this metadatabase, and this kind of causes a task isolation conflict and also potentially security issues at this particular stage. One key change which we're actually making as part of Airflow 3 is to separate this interaction between the tasks and the Airflow metadatabase. We're introducing a concept which we're calling the task execution interface the Airflow workers will no longer be directly connecting to the Airflow metadatabase, but will be going through this task execution interface. On the server component side, there'll be a new component called the API server, which will receive requests from Airflow workers in the form of this task execution interface. The API server is not a separate component to be installed and managed, but it is going to run as part of the Airflow web server itself. On the client side, the Airflow task will actually use a new distribution and a new component, which we're calling the Airflow task SDK, which will include objects, which will, in, which will encapsulate this interface for the, which we're calling the task execution interface to kind of go forward. The task execution interface will also include the context information for the task to start, as well as the status information for the task to be fed in to the Airflow metadatabase through the API server when the task completes. How does this actually help? Right? The first thing is with task isolation. We are actually taking away access from the Python code to go read and write access directly to the Airflow metadatabase, which eliminates the security issue. This is also even more the case. I mean, it's even stronger when multiple data teams with a variety of different data access have access to the shared Airflow metadatabase. Now, because these, connect, these task Python code will not directly be accessing the Airflow metadatabase, but will actually be going through the API server, that vulnerability goes away. We're gonna have a much stronger published security posture for Airflow post this particular change as part of Airflow 3. The second key th thing which we talked about is dependency management. Now, the isolation through this task SDK enables a different model 
for being able to plug in the Python dependencies for each task through the task SDK. You no longer need to kind of create separate images for each incarnation to work, so this becomes far more of a Pythonic incarnation of being able to express dependencies without needing to kind of have a DevOps way of having to create customer images and then run these particular customer images through the Kubernetes pod operator. Thirdly, and this is a conceptual shift, which we really like people to start thinking about the Airflow server components similar to an application server or a web server and the Airflow tasks, similar to that about being a web browser. And the interface to these, similar to HTTP, is now the task execution interface. As a result of this, we expect and would strongly advocate for platform Airflow platform administrators to be able to upgrade the Airflow server components based on their own maintenance schedules, which would be independent from data teams who would actually be updating and upgrading Airflow based on their task SDK when they choose to say, hey, look, I've got new Python dependencies, I've got an updated Python framework, and I need to use an updated task SDK for that particular reasons. So again, this creates a very decoupled architecture for like upgradability, maintainability, versionability, and so on and so forth. Now, how is this all going to work? So yeah, the Airflow web server as it exists today is, is going to change. As kind of Brent mentioned in the previous talk, if you were here, um, there's going to be, we're going to have a UI for the, for the API. We're going to have a couple of APIs, whether that is one process or many, kind of doesn't matter. There's going to be a new API, um, which the task is going to com communicate with, and there's going to be a new Python module, the Python task SDK. This is going to be a separate distribution. You can install it. It's going to have like a strict API, versioned API between the Airflow server, the Airflow API, and the tasks. This will contain all the stuff you need at runtime. None of the scheduling logic, because that still lives in the Airflow core. This is all kind of like the runtime stuff of what you put in your DAG files, in your task, and how you execute a task. So what does it look like? I should kind of preface this with all of this code works, but it is demo code. This is not how, like, don't expect these interfaces to be exactly this, but this is kind of my current best guess, and it's open to discussion, but this is kind of broadly what it's going to look like. So previously, you would have from Airflow import DAG. Now you're going to do uh, from Airflow SDK import DAG. And now I can hear all of you going, wait, what? I've got to rewrite all my DAGs? Of course not. I'm not that stupid. I would get strung up if I suggested that. It might issue a warning, but it will still work. Uh, and rather than just tell you that, let's, um, let's, let, let's show it. Now let's see how. So in this one, we have, uh, this is an FO2, and here's a small example. Um, should be very familiar to you. This is a kind of hacked up example DAG. What it does doesn't really matter. It's got, what's it got? A batch operator and a SQL app. It doesn't matter. It's a DAG. Um, and you can see, maybe you can't, but it says Airflow 2.0. This is an Airflow 2 virtual environment that I have activated, and I'm doing, there you go, Airflow version, which instantly takes a while. There we go, 2.10.1. And let's just run this task. Um, which if you've all run it, it's kind of familiar. So almost normal, that's just like, hey, look, this works. Now I switch over to the Airflow 3 virtual environment. Uh, the task has to get prototype, I think, just to prove it. Oh, I didn't show you the same day. But there you go, it's a completely different output. And the one thing to notice is this yellow warning up here. Please import from Airflow task SDK instead. DAGs still work. Like, don't worry. You do not have to rewrite 100% of DAGs in existence. That would just kill Airflow. Not going to happen. So yeah, that, that, that's kind of there where we are. Kind of, it's a big change, but it's also not a big user-facing change. There's going to be some, you're going to get some deprecation warnings until you fix things. If you don't like that thing, if you want it still to be from airflow.dag, speak up on the mailing list. We're still talking about that, what this plan is. So yeah, the task execution interface, um, which includes, as kind of Vikram said, it's all the, the task context. So that's kind of, all the big context dictionary, that's the task instance, your DAG, your DAG run, access all kind of things like that. This is also going to contain, I should just say Airflow variables, access to Airflow variables and particularly secrets. So one of the problems right now, with a task having direct database access, it can read every single secret in Airflow. And it's got like, you've got access or you've got nothing. Yeah, you technically could do something really smart with rare level security, but no one does it. With this, everything going via an API, you can put controls in place. You can say, like, this DAG should have access to this task, this secret only, and maybe even this one specific 
task should only have access to this secret. This kind of plays on with some of the multi-tenancy, multi-team stuff of like maybe you want some global, global, team, global connections and then but only access to a few places. So it's, he doesn't do it here, but it gives us the point to hook that in. Obviously, you need to report the task status, you need the heartbeat, it's all kind of stuff like this. To some extent, it's a very simple API. The last point is kind of the, the, the key takeaway here, which is no direct database access to tasks. If you currently have a, a custom task and you are using anything from Airflow models, give or take, that's going to break. That's the one exception, and this is why it's happening in 3.0. This is going to break some custom operators. And for that, I'm sorry, but it's worth it for the reasons I'll get onto. The other thing that's probably worth uh, mentioning at this point, this actually helps scaling as well. If you have even a medium-sized Airflow install, one of the pain points is scaling the database. Not because of the query load, but particularly if you're using Postgres, the number of connections. This drops that, you know, if you've got 100 concurrent tasks, that's 100 or sometimes 200 connections sitting there basically doing nothing. This, it drops it to two. That's going to make scale, running a larger cluster so much easier. I love the fact that we're actually separating this out into client server, but it enables a few other things. One more thing. One of the key changes we want to be able to make us built on this model is really being able to run tasks anywhere. We can actually run the Airflow server components on one computing cluster. You can also, like today, for backwards compatibility, and because you choose to, you can also run Airflow workers on that same computing cluster. But going forward, you will actually be able to run Airflow workers on a completely different remote cluster, whether it's on the same cloud, it's on a different cloud, whether it's on your enterprise private cloud, whether it's on an edge network, literally anywhere. And that's a key change which, we, uh, which we're going to enable using this as part of Airflow 3. Remote execution of tasks. And there's a lot of work which Jens is also working on over there as part of remote execution, which I think now has changed to edge execution as well. But that's kind of the foundation of how we're going to enable very remote capabilities. Now, why is this significant? In a lot of cases, enterprises actually have private clouds designated and like enterprise applications cannot leave that private, enter, private deployment either for regulatory requirements or for security concerns. We want to enable those to stay where they are but still be able to be orchestrated centrally. A second key use case over and beyond that is, is something we're seeing with respect to Gen AI, wherein a lot of the tasks in a generative AI set of pipelines are regular data handling tasks which deal with data unstructured data handling, chunking, being able to transform that from like you know, whatever format it is into then a textual form. But then there are some long-running tasks which would really benefit with the GPU execution. Now with Airflow 3, that becomes completely straightforward. You can keep your regular CPU-focused tasks on your existing computing, computing infrastructure. You can then call out to a rent a GPU cluster for those particular tasks which would benefit from GPU-based execution. This also helps with security isolation, and as we talked about, it meets data locality mandates. And how does this work? So yeah, so kind of like, right now you kind of define your DAG in Python, and it lives on your schedule, it lives on your worker, it lives on your web server. What do I need to change in my DAG? You, uh, too much talking, I'm just gonna show you. <laughs> so I've got an Airflow deployment running on, here we go, Airflow deployment running on localhost. This is not me playing a trick, this is, I wasn't foolish enough to do a live demo, so I pre-recorded it all. But this is a local Airflow, local database. Kind of, you can see what you got. Uh, it's a simple ETL, exact, extract, transform, load. And I've got an EC2 instance here, um, which I have, for the sake of argument, set up a security groups. So there is SSH in, and the only outbound traffic from this node is HTTPS traffic. To anywhere, but HTTPS only. So over here, I can SSH into it. Trust me, it is an EC2 instance. There we go, it's running. And I should just show you the DAG you've got there. Uh, sorry, that one is a little bit small, but it's a, it's the standard extract transform node from the tutorial DAG in Airflow, but for the sake of my sanity, um, I wrote it with bash operator because that's what made support. As I say, this was kind of like demo code of, it supports this particular use case right now, but it's a standard, there's three tasks, 
and they, they run ahead. So if we switch back to the Airflow scheduler, the Airflow UI, so kind of the Airflow, there we go, Airflow Remote Worker Connect, and you give a server. Um, that's using ngrok to speak back to my laptop. Um, if you're not familiar with ngrok, it is a very cool tool. It's free, and it allows you to expose an HTTP or any kind of port on your laptop under a random IP address as long as you're running that little daemon. So it's a useful way of doing kind of demos like this. Um, and then I go and trigger the DAG, and there we go, we see some, some logs over there on the right-hand side, and here's the Airflow, and this is using the same sort of thing, same sort of display I, you, you saw from the logs before. Um, you've got the warning. Um, as kind of Brent mentioned in the, in the thing, um, this isn't UI, this isn't JSON logs yet, but it is using a thing called struct log, um, a wonderful project by Hanek. He seems to write all the best Python modules. I just love everything he writes. But it makes it very easy to have a pretty log like this and also JSON logs. So there's full structured logs. I can get into some of the details of how this works in a minute, but right now that's what we've got. And there's the ngrok thing. So here you get a kind of sample of some of the API endpoints that this is used. So this, this definitely comes into, this is ARP72, the task execution interface. A lot of this also plays into 69, which is the kind of the remote or the edge executor. In some regards, there's no difference between them. They're all remote in that they're, they're going to speak to an API. So salary, like task may start over salary, but then once the task starts, it's going to use this API. Um, so the only difference is how the tasks get to the remote worker in the first place. There's UUIDs for every task and, and stuff like that. And yeah, you still see the warning here. At part, the, the same warning I saw, like, hey, you've got deprecation warnings. It shows up there. One of the nice things about structured logging is we can then tag those with the JSON, and then we can show those, hey, you've got a deprecation warning in this diagram to make it easier. So we actually were very keen on getting the remote execution working, without a doubt. I mean, that is something which we've been talking about for like, I don't know, at least a couple of years. This has come up in a few different use cases. But why stop there? We really wanted to expand Airflow to be able to run tasks in any language. As of 3.0, Airflow is going to be language agnostic. Remember, we talked about a task execution interface. The task execution interface is language independent, classic interface definition language. Therefore, the API server can obviously speak to task SDKs coming from a variety of different languages. Why would we even do this, you might ask? We actually, as a community, have already gotten requests from people actually building Gen AI applications in TypeScript to say, hey, can Airflow support TypeScript tasks? We have already gotten requests for people to say, can Airflow support Kotlin for enterprise application integration? And that's kind of started us kind of down this path as well. And now the fact that we've got a language independent task execution interface enables us to take this further because the reality is all of us who are already been using Airflow know and love Python. But as software application teams are building more and more data applications, we want to meet them where they are in their language of choice, not having to require them to rewrite stuff in Python to kind of go forward. Therefore, our path forward is towards being able to create task SDKs, not just in Python, but in additional languages going forward. And these task SDKs, in whatever language, will use the same task execution interface to talk to the same Airflow API server so that we can have multiple incarnations of DAGs being written and tasks being written communicating to the same Airflow server deployment. In addition to being language agnostic, Airflow 3 is also going to be multilingual. Now, what the hell does that actually mean? And there's a separation between DAG versus task, which is very, very deliberately chosen in this case. We want to enable options wherein people actually write a DAG. They're pulling data from a Java enterprise application, and they've written an extract task using Java. They can perform transformations using Python and SQL, perform an analysis in that same DAG using Scala, and get the result of that analysis, which could be a prediction, and put this back using i.e. the reverse ETL term into an application running in Go, and you could actually do this absolutely seamlessly within the context of, of a single DAG. Now, that might seem like a little bit like a contrived example, but in reality, with things like you know, AI models and generative AI, you might initially build a task in Python to kind of get it up and running, proof of concept, and be able to execute. 
you might then choose to change the implementation completely to something like C++ for sheer performance and efficiency. And that is something you can do now by just changing the elements within a single DAG. You don't need to rewrite the entire pipeline going forward. So we really believe that this is a key way, not only for going forward, but also kind of incorporating and making it easier for legacy migrations. But when you're pulling data from an existing enterprise application and you want to use the language of choice to pull that data from there without having to rewrite the entire ecosystem to kind of go forward. And Ash is going to show us how it works. So yeah, uh, Golang, Task SDK, kind of what SDK do I use? How do you do this and go, what does my DAG code look like? So as kind of Vikram mentioned, at this point, we are talking about tasks. We are not talking about DAGs. DAGs will still be in Python. That's like, we can change that later, but right now, we've got enough to, to, to chew here. So it's just the tasks. DAGs will be in Python, or you use something like DAG Factory and a, a YAML generator if, if, you know, if you want Go people to use it. But let's say you wanted to write, run a Go task today in Airflow 2. How could you do this? Probably with a bash operator, to be honest either code pod operator or bash operator, and you either do go run or you pre-compile it and then you make it available in your image, and congratulations, you now have Airflow plus a whole load of DevOps kind of thing, and in practice, no one's gonna do this. Like, maybe there are a few people who are. I'm not gonna say no one's do this, but you're not gonna do this unless you either really, really want to use Airflow or you're forced to by your manager. So that, that's not gonna happen. So what could it look like in Airflow 3? We've got a thing here, we've got task.external. So this is the kind of standard task flow decorator. You've got task. Um, you also have things like task.docker or task.virtual environment. Those already exist. This is, this is just my idea. This is like three days old code at this point. But um, you need some way to tell Airflow, like, this task should run somewhere else. Where it runs, it doesn't actually care. Um, we've given it a queue name because you probably need to register the workers to say, hey, I, I'm, I, I can t accept tasks on this queue. So here we go task.external of my go queue, and then you just call a function, go.extract. You're not gonna, like, there's a few downsides to this, like, editors are not gonna know what parameters are gonna accept, and yeah, whatever, fine. Um, that's less than ideal, but extract returns some data. This, if you're at all familiar with task flow, it looks very similar, you just got this little go.prefix prefix in it. So you extract some data, give it back, you pass it into the transform thing, and here we go, here's a multi one, and then, You've got a Python, normal Python function at the end, which takes the, the, the Go, the output of the Go task via XCOM, via something like that, and runs it. Now, this is one of the key things that you can't really do today. So here is roughly what the code looks like for powering this in Go, and I will show you a demo in a minute. I'd just like to highlight a couple of points here. So first off, you obviously import from Airflow, import Go SDK, and you can get variables. You can get secrets. I just did variables, for example. Having your Go task being able to access Airflow secrets and Airflow variables. This is one of the things that really brings it to a first class integration rather than a, yeah, just run the program. It's like you can access the Airflow ecosystem. Um, the other thing you can do is you can return, here we go, you can return, a, a, you can return an object that has some JSON tags and then the Airflow Go SDK runner, needs a better name, We'll handle, okay, like I'll serialize that object and I'll put it into XCOM for you or whatever backing saw you've configured. And it's like, this is kind of like all the power of composability or reuse with, with DAGs, but in your language of choice. This is ultimately kind of like a fairly, fairly simple, no, fairly small API. So it's like, there's a kind of couple of endpoints and stuff. The other point, and this is particular to a Go task, or maybe a JVM task, any compiled language. If it's Python, if it's probably TypeScript, I'm gonna say yes, you can load things dynamically at runtime. You can just import a string and you can load. That's, that's how Python tasks work right now, is it just imports a string, the files on disk, it loads up, job's good. For Go and for JVM, mostly, that's not the case and you need to compile it in. So how does the runner know what task it has? And what you have to do is you register a task on a DAG. Right now, that's what we've got. This is where the, like, there's no structure, there's no dependencies, it's just, for this DAG here is the task function. That's a kind of function, we do some introspection and kind of see what it exists. Um, and then, down here right at the bottom, uh, worker.runforever, server URL. There's a whole load more detail here. There's like, how do we authenticate this properly? How do we, how does the, when the worker registers, how does it know what queues to listen on? 
do we need to like have some kind of capabilities of say, hey, like I'm a Go worker, I can listen on these queues, or maybe I've got these versions and another one has these versions. Um, there's a lot of interaction with the, the kind of the DAG versioning and the DAG fetcher AIPs to work out to kind of make this a first, first class and well integrated. But the bit that I'm sure we all want to see, let's go to, so this is the same EC2 instance as before. So Airflow Go Worker, this is kind of a binary. There was a little bit more code than I showed in the previous slides, but not much. Again, same sort of thing. You give it a server URL where to connect to. Because this is a demo, there's no auth. It's lovely and easy. So unfortunately, real code isn't that easy, but there we go. So yeah, same example, same example DAG. I just kind of tweet it a little bit, kick it off, and wait for the logs. So obviously, we've got the EC2 thing on the left here. EC2, or my implementation of it, it wasn't working very well. So I've got a task that runs for 12 seconds and outputs a couple of logs. Just waiting for it. You can see lots of output on the left. So here we go. Here's the output. This is one of the interesting ones. So when it loads, so here we go. My variable, hello remote go worker. So that is the remote go worker. Got a task written in Go, which has access to this variable. And then also, just to kind of prove it's possible, the task is marked as failure, and it says error, please fail. And if I go over here and look at the DAG, here we go, error, please fail. So standard Go function, you, return, you, you know, the Go idiom is your function either returns an error or an object in an error, and then the, the runner looks at the error code and um, yeah, converts that to an error. One other thing I would like to point out, kind of which I haven't mentioned so far, is some of the security here. You can sort of just see it here in the background. But th this big, long, string here is a JWT token. Every remote task has a strongly verifiable identity. You can know that if you, when you receive a request to the API server, it came from this DAG, this task, this task run. So A, like that's, you know, it's used in JWT, F has got a, a secret key that's generated. With that identity you can trust, it gives you these hook points where you can start adding more security controls and audit, both kind of two sides of the same coin. So yeah, that's, that's a key part of what makes this a big change is you can know what requests are coming from and you can make decisions based on them. I haven't done any of that yet, but it's like, okay, well, we can put in a security manager here about anything accessing a connection or a variable. You can make sure that a task can only update itself. It can't go and update everything else. It can't go and write things and, and, and mess around. Our thinking on, on this, as Ash pointed out, is we want tasks in different languages to be completely integrated and have a completely seamless experience. But we really need you really need feedback from all of you. Love, you, uh, love for you folks to try it out as remote execution for sure as we work uh, towards Airflow 3. We expect to have beta builds ready towards the end of the year. So beginning of January, we expect to have a couple of months of uh, beta. So we want to act and the release candidates are targeted for March. So please do try this out as part of beta. Please let us know before. And we're also recruiting contributors. A new language basically means an entirely new set of providers and new set of operators in this particular language to make it easier, and that's part of the Airflow ecosystem. So again, please let us also know which languages are of interest. I, I reference that there is some interest in like you know, TypeScript and Kotlin with other people have brought up, but clearly you might actually have very different needs, and we'd love to hear from you about what those are and how to prioritize going forward. One thing we absolutely wanted to make sure was to have both the interpreted language and a compiled language, just to make sure we're covering all the bases. But outside of that, pretty open. Love to hear from you. Love to kind of uh, get you to participate in this, both in trying it out and actually contributing as well. Thank you so much for listening.